go live in 5 seconds okay shall we uh, can you uh, can you call dr narendran once to join yeah okay no try it once again kartik his phone is not uh, is not lifting okay okay let's start good evening everyone i welcome you all to know in adi uh, battle of pits a tn uc initiative today we are having finals yesterday we had a wonderful session of prelims in which a participant exhibited various case presented various cases and it was a wonderful discussion with the judges and we have selected uh, nine participants for the finals okay uh, moving on to uh, just talking about the young ophthalmologic society of india uh, and dr nilesh kumar is the joint secretary and he is working in madhavi netralya ara bihar and dr avnish upade is a treasurer he is working at iq gurgaon next is dr karan batia he is a secretary he is working at rishi eye foundation meerut next is uh, Dr. Devakant Mishra, Vice President, is working at Savadan Jyoti Eye Hospital, Lucknow. Uh, next is Dr. Dick Vijay Singh, uh, Immediate Past President, is working at Noble Eye Care, Gurgaon. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Sonal Kalia, she is a President. Uh, she is an Assistant Professor from. Uh, she is an Assistant Professor of Upgraded Ophthalmology Department. of uh, sms medical college jaipur she is anterior segment surgeon and she is the president of uc she is the executive member of jaipur ophthalmological society and she is executive member of rajasthan ophthalmological society first uh, i would like to thank dr sonal kalia the president of uc who uh, who has given us uh, such a wonderful opportunity to conduct this event and i'll give ho ho hand over to dr sonal please thank you so much for the kind introduction uh, dr kartikeyan uh, i'll start sharing my screen uh, yeah here. yeah so i'm extremely um, Uh, happy to introduce this particular uh, you know final competition of the tnoc case presentation and um, i i wish to first of all acknowledge the hard work that has been put in by dr kartikeyan who's uh, a senior resident at rpc new delhi and uh, the, his team of organizers have been very industrious in their entire approach and you know it has taken a lot of months for them to bring this uh, you know competition into the present form that it has been so many discussions have gone into it they tried to collaborate with lot of uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know societies and college is and ultimately bringing it to this particular uh, current form that it is today in the um, organizers who worked very hard need to be acknowledged uh, you know personally and uh, apart from dr kartik and it's dr prasanna from trichy dr niranjan kartik from chennai and dr pranesh ravi from coimbatore uh, and um, uh, i'm extremely grateful to the panelists who are joining us today they were the judges for the prelims held yesterday a lot of cases were presented and it must have been a mammoth task to really you know condense those uh, wonderful presentations into the best of uh, the cases that will be presented today for uh, all of you to see and the judges for today are dr avnish dr nilesh and dr aditya sethi uh, dr avnish is the uh, treasurer of uh, young ophthalmology society of india he is at gurugram dr nilesh is uh, joining us from alabad he is the joint secretary of young ophthalmology society of india dr aditya sethi is again uh, joining us from the ncr uh, he is associated with anurodhay desert hospital and he is um, uh, a yossi executive as well 
and um, I am extremely grateful to Dr. Nirmal Frederick, sir, who is uh, joining us today as the guest of honor. Uh, it's uh, our proud privilege to uh, uh, introduce him today. He's the president-elect Tamil Nadu of Thalmic Association, and he is currently the chief eye surgeon and, and MD at Nirmal's Eye Hospital. And uh, this hospital is located at Tambaram in Tamil Nadu. Uh, sir has uh, been the uh, principal assessor at NABH Quality Council of India, and he has has uh, many uh, you know uh, lectures to his credit and he is uh, uh, a winner of several awards at national and international uh, you know levels and uh, the prestigious TNOA Dr. Joseph Ganetic Oration of uh, 2017 and Professor VVR IMA NHB uh, Oration are the latest ones. And we welcome you, sir, and we are grateful that you'll be finding time for uh, seeing the talent of the young ophthalmologists that uh, this team of uh, Dr. Um, Prasanna and Dr. Kartike and Dr. Uh, have tried to, you know, uh, assemble together for uh, the Young Ophthalmologist Society of India case presentation. So case presentations basically the foundation for uh, you know uh, the um, bigger things like case series and then finally you know um, publications like case reports so that is why it is very important to begin at the grassroots levels and young ophthalmologist society has always uh, stood uh, for uh, presentations by young ophthalmologists and for young ophthalmologists. So uh, that is why the judges also have all been from the Young Ophthalmology Society of India. And uh, once again, I wish to uh, say that all the presenters have worked very hard and I wish them luck and I hope that the best ones win today. All the best to you and the team also. I think Dr. Pranesh, And thank, you, thank you, Sonal, ma'am, yeah. for, uh, for this wonderful uh, kickstart of this event. Uh, over to Pranesh. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. So, I'll not be introducing the judges for the final of uh, your CK's presentation, TN chapter. Uh, we have three judges for this evening. Our first judge is Dr. Aditya Sethi. Dr. Aditya is currently practicing as a pediatric ophthalmologist, Travis Mesologist, and cataract refractive surgeon at Arnodia Desert Eye Hospital program. He did his post graduation from Shankar Netralia and went on to complete a long term fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology in 2016, also from Shankar Netralia. He has 15 publications to his credit and also the scientific member of scientific committee of UOC. He is in his FACO fellowship from Rajan and his keen interests are periodic cataract, myopia, premium and toric IOs. Our uh, second judge for the day is Dr. Ravni Shupadhyay. He is a vitro retina consultant from IQ Hospital, so, uh, super specialty eye hospital from Gurugram. And uh, our third judge is Dr. Nilesh Kumar. Dr. Nilesh Kumar is from KMC Manipal, Belgaum, and is post-graduation from Lotus Eye Hospital, Coimbatore. He's trained in retina from Lotus and uh, DH Patna. He's now the medical director of Madhvi Netralaya. He is innovated uh, to go angle imaging device called as Dix Pro, which has been awarded in multiple innovator sessions and also holds special interest in academics and research, having authored 85 published articles and presented over 65 papers. He's been called for many inviter lectures in national and international forum, and his research interests are smartphone imaging and medical retina. And I would also like to thank the panelists, Dr. Madan, Dr. Neha, uh, for being present for today's panels. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, judges. Okay. Now, let, let's let start with the session. Uh, Dr. Aditya, can you start, share your presentation? Uh, all the best to all the participants. Dr. Aditya, are you here? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. I'm starting my screen. You can start your present presentation. Time is five minutes for all participants. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen, sir? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. I thank the UOC team and the organizers and the judges for allowing me to present here today. I'm going to be presenting a case report on bilateral hypopion uveitis and masquerade syndrome in a case of carcinoma breast. 
a 60 year old female presented with throbbing pain throbbing and radiating pain in the left eye also with redness photophobia and blurring of vision in both eyes for 3 days there were no relieving factors and there was no history of prior trauma or ocular surgery past history shows a known case of carcinoma breast for which an incision biopsy of the breast mass had showed invasive ductal carcinoma for which she had undergone a right modified radical mastectomy 2 months ago she is also a non controlled diabetic with a random sugar level of 382 and has b1c of 10.8 She is also known hypertensive and hypercholesterolemia on treatment. There were no significant personal or family histories. Moving on to the ocular examination. Ocular examination of right eye, visual acuity was 6-12. The color vision, lid, conjunctiva cornea were normal. The anterior chamber, however, was shallow with short cells of 1 plus and flare grade 2 with a 1 mm hyperpion. The rest of the examination was with the normal limits. In the left eye, the patient denied perception of light. There was lit edema with preceptal cellulitis. Conjunctival chemosis was present. Again, the anterior chamber showed cells and cells 3 plus flare grade 3 with a 2 mm hypopion. The iris also had ectropion uv and dirubiosis iridis. And there was occlusio pupillae. The IOP was mildly elevated and about 24 mm HG. Uh, this was a presentation of the patient with uh, hypopion in both eyes. Uh, gonioscopy was done and uh, the right eye showed open angles while the left eye showed narrow angles. Fundus examination on slit lamp with a 78 diopter lens uh, of the right eye. The media was hazy while the rest of the examination was normal. There was no evidence of any choroidal infiltrates or subretinal abscess. A left eye, the fun, there was no view of the fundus. So a diagnosis of acute anterior uveitis with narrow angles was made. And the patient was started on nitropen drops twice daily, pred acetate hourly, a 0.5% timolol twice daily. She was also started on prednisolone 60 mg per day, which was tapered, and tablet acetazolamide 250 mg uh, twice for three days. The uveitis and hypopion had, start, had started to resolve after two days. However, the patient returned after two weeks with pain in the left eye, and this time the examination showed a scleral abscess with conjunctival chemosis preceptal cellulitis and proptosis of the left eye. A B scan was done which showed moderate reflective echoes in the vitreous with irregular retinochoroidal effusion and multiple lobulations. Uh, there was thickening of the choroid with early T sign was also noted and an MRI showed uh, enlarged le left globe with a discontinuous nasal sclera, thickening of optic nerve and uh, soft tissue edema. So this was the B scan showing the increased peripapillary choroidal thickening and early T sign. So a diagnosis of panophthalmitis with masquerade syndrome was made and the patient was referred to oncology for evaluation. Uh, she then received two cycles of radiation and she was further evaluated with uh, a PET scans which showed pericardial uh, fusion and pulmonary metastasis of the first uh, and involvement of the first rib. She was later started on chemotherapy with adriamycin cyclophosphamide and this time the uveitis and panophthalmitis resolved completely at the end of three months and her vision improved to 6 9 in the right eye and 6 by 60 in the left eye. So, ocular metastasis is seen in up to 25% of the patients with carcinoma of breast, and the secondary angle closure in our patient could have been either due to inflammation or neoplastic cells. Uh, Panophthalmitis indicates a widespread dissemination of the tumor cells within the orbit. Uh, anterior chambers uh, sampling would be conclusive to identify these uh, neoplastic cells. Among all ocular metastasis, breast carcinoma is unique because it can cause a bilateral seeding in both eyes. So to conclude, uh, when patients in the extremities of age present with similar signs and symptoms, one must keep in mind the possibility of a masquerade. The chances of metastasis in a case of intraductal carcinoma is high with a rapid spread to uveal tract due to its rich vascularity. In 15 to 23%, ocular metastasis is the presenting feature in carcinoma of breast. Hence, regular screening of metastatic lesions in the eye for all patients with breast carcinoma, even those who are not asymptomatic, is important. So, when a patient presents with uh, anterior uveitis and is having a poor uh, uh, systemic condition, we should always uh, keep in mind the possibility of uh, breast carcinoma. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Thank you, Dr. Aditya, for this wonderful uh, case presentation. Uh, next, uh, we have the judges. Uh, judges... Uh, Dr. Aditya Sethi, uh, you want to ask anything to Dr. Uh, Aditya? 
Yeah, I excellent presentation, Aditya. Thank you, so much. Thank you. Aditya. Yeah. And uh, yes, masquerade syndrome. Um, uh, you you did a systemic evaluation, and uh, did you did you mention all the uh, systemic medications and everything that the patient was on? Do you think that has an influence also on your uh, the glaucoma? And uh, uh, actually, in our patient, the angles were also closer, so it could have been. Uh, Due to the inflammatory process, process or even the neoplastic cells. What about the systemic medications? Anything that you could uh, pick out to cause uh, any uh, other inflammation? It was started on systemic chemotherapy, sir. But uh, uh, all right, thank you. Yes, okay. uh, can I? Yeah, can I ask one question, uh, Doctor Aditya? Can you uh, open the presentation and show us the clinical picture, the anterior segment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, because uh, the, see the medial canthus of the left eye also is towards. Uh, uh, it it looks like it is both both are right eye picture only. That's why I wanted to uh, open this. So uh, is it a mistake oh. or? I think uh, because it's zoomed in. It, uh... No no the medial canthus won't be uh, like the laterality won't change now. So it, is it yes. a mirror image or something? Something is uh, there. So okay, yes, I understand what you're asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, no, uh, the main main thing I wanted to open this for was uh, the you told there is present of neovascularization and atropian UVA. Yes. So uh, the patient uh, who is uh, PL negative or uh, PL dubious, improving to 660 with resolution of hypopion with NVG, uh, yes. is quite. Uh, so, uh, was the hypopion result that you cleared? Uh, was the posterior segment evaluation done apart from B scan? Uh, after the after the resolution of the hypopion, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. We did uh, do, sir. But there was still okay. some uh, haze. Okay. But we could not find any metastatic lesion or choroidal mass. Sir. Okay. No, no, no retinop uh, like uh, no retinal detachment or anything. No, sir. No, sir. So, uh, so the cause of uh, the neovascularization is still uh, not known. Yes. Sir. Did did, uh, did the resolution uh, did the new uh, NVG reduce after the resolution of hypopion? Yes, sir. Uh, the vascularity did reduce, sir, but there okay. were still vessels present. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Avnisha. I think we have the panel here, so. From my side, for this case, it's more than enough. Uh, if the panel has to ask anything, anybody from the panel, uh, do you want to ask a question regarding this case? Dr. Sujit, do you want to ask anything? I mean, I just wanted to know what chemotherapy regimen the patient was kept on, but I think he, he doesn't. Uh, uh, Andrea Mason was given, sir. Andrea Mason. Yes, sir. Okay. And cyclophosphamide. Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. I think we can move on to the next case presentation. Dr. Koman, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can start your screen sharing. Now. Uh, can I start, sir? Yes, you can start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak my uh, to speak uh, at this uh, UC platform. Today, I'm going to present an unusual case of a late spontaneous reattachment of desmet membrane detachment post deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. And my co-author, co Dr. Shrish Kumar and Dr. D. Ramavati, sir. So a 13 years old male patient came with chief complaints of diminution of vision in both eyes since few months. Past ocular history and family history was not significant. Uh, his uncorrected visual acuity was 636, not improving further in right eye and finger counting two meters, not improving further in left eye. On slit lamp examination, they were there was corneal thinning and Vox tri noted in right eye and corneal thinning, Vox tri along with deep stromal scar in left eye. All of the parameters were within normal limits. 
So uh, topography was done for this patient, and uh, there was severe keratoconus more as compared to right eye. So it was decided uh, to uh, to uh, DALC was advised for this patient. So patient underwent uh, DALC under general anesthesia. So big bubble technique was. Uh, 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 initially decided, but it ended up with a large type two bubble, which was not intended. Then some manual uh, layer by layer dissection was done, as type two bubble are more prone to uh, perforate. But uh, still, a small per peripheral perforation was noted towards the end of the surgery. But still, we continued with the dark as the uh, as the perforation was small and it was noted in the periphery. So air bubble was injected into the anterior chamber and dissection was continued up to the duals layer. And then after trifining with 8.25 mm trifine, donor cornea was sutured and a small mobile air bubble was ensured in the anterior chain. So this is the post one, uh, day one post-op picture. This is a slit lamp photo, which is showing graft edema and a desmets membrane detachment. Here in the ASOCT, we can see a large desmets membrane detachment from one end of the uh, graft to the other end. So uh, post-operatively, patient was started on gatifloxacin and Fredford drops in a tapering dosage and Timolol was given 0.5% twice a day and desmetopexy was advised for this patient. But patient's parents were not willing for resurgery and considering the risk of general anesthesia, conservative management and observation was decided for this patient. So this is the two weeks post-surgery patient uh, 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 picture, which is showing uh, decrease in the graft edema and the gap has also reduced between the detailed desmet membrane and the uh, graft. So after one month of DAL, patient's best corrected visual acuity improved to 6 by 12 with 6 diopter cylinder at 90 degree and intraocular pressure was also 16 millimeter of mercury. So this is the slit lamp examination after one month where the graft has become totally clear and there is a reattachment of the desmet membrane. So coming to the discussion part, DALC is a safe technique for stromal corneal pathology where there is no involvement of endothelium. Uh, small perforations that are less than 1 mm procedure can be continued. But if there is a large perforation during early stage only, we have to convert it to penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, in the, uh, if uh, the perforation it has a late stage and away from the center, we can still continue with the DALC. So micro perforations can occur during the manual dissection or it may occur during the suturing and it may lead to formation of early post-operative desmets membrane detachment and double uh, anterior chamber formation. Uh, there are reports of uh, spontaneous resolution of desmet membrane detachment uh, following DALC without DM perforation. So there is this case report in a 77-year-old female who underwent a DALC and the spontaneous reattachment was seen after five months after uh, five months of failed desmetopexy. There is a similar case study uh, where in a 50-year-old woman post DALC, uh, there was spontaneous reattachment was seen after failed air bubble injection. So uh, the spontaneous reattachment of desmet membrane detachment can occur in pediatric patients post DALC even as late as one month post surgery. Hence, uh, conservative management and observation can be considered if resurgery is not possible. Uh, routine follow-up of this patient is very important uh, to check whether there is a gain in the endothelial pump function, whether there is restoration of the intercellular complexes and integrity. But larger case studies with appropriate follow-up of this patient is required. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Komal. Thank you, sir. Uh, judges, uh, over to you. Even at the panels, you are also feel free to ask uh, any questions to Dr. Komal. Yeah, over to the judges. Hi, Komal. Uh, great presentation. Um, Hello, sir. Uh, you had some pre-operative uh, photos. Can you go back to that also? Yes. Uh, did you do a specular and did you do a, a ASO steep uh, pre-op also? Did I miss that? Um, uh, no, sir. Pre-op, uh, specular and ASOC, ASO city we didn't do, sir. You didn't do? Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, you sure this was uh, a dialc worthy case? Yes, sir. Here the uh, KMAX readings were more than 80, uh, 80, sir. So, and best character visual acuity was also not improving, sir. So, dialc was the preferred uh, cho choice for this case, sir. Would you generally do an anterior segment OCT preoperatively if you're going to perform an a anterior laminar character class? So generally we would do we would do sir if there is like a stromal scarring in other patients but this was like a proved case of a keratoconus so oh. here is that's why we didn't do otherwise we generally do sir prior to any dark patients sir. 
and specular and everything you've done. Uh, yes, you, sir, yes, sir. Routinely, yes, we are doing. But in this case, we didn't. Any particular reason, because pediatric or any other reason that you wouldn't do this? So just uh, because uh, the scarring was also at the anterior lamellar level, we were uh, uh, consultants were sure about this. And uh, considering the fact that this is a, a, a severe keratoconus, we decided uh, without any uh, endothelial involvement, we decided to go with uh, this only dark. And have you seen this patient in the post-op after that, uh, what you presented? Has there been better uh, results? Yes, sir, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Any sir. images from there? No. Ah, uh, sir. Any images from recent post-op, uh, recent uh, visit? Ah, uh, no, sir. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Emulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can call it. No, no, no. Just wait, wait. Uh, let them finish. Any other panel uh, wants to ask a question? Uh, you know. Dr. Dr. Neha, Dr. Neha, you're on mute, I think. Uh, I saw you speaking, you're on mute. Uh, uh, yeah, madam is on mute, but I think she has to increase her volume. Madam, can you hear me, madam? Uh, uh, you're able to uh, hear you speak. I mean, not, not able to hear you speak. Either it's on mute or... Uh, there seems to be a technical. Uh, should choose a uh, mic setting settings. Yes, to we'll change it. Okay. Any any other panel, uh, Madan sir? Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, we can move. Uh, we welcome Dr. Dick Vijay, the immediate past president. He just currently joined the Zoom meeting now. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thanks, thanks. I think uh, how are you guys you. all doing? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for joining the meeting. Welcome, welcome sir. Thank you. Welcome, Thank you. Thank you. We can, okay, if there are no more questions, we can move on to the next presentation. Yeah. Dr. Medula. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's visible. You can continue. Good evening to one and all. I am Dr. Mridula Vijay Raghavan from Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. And today I'll be presenting an interesting case about the wonders of Botox in acquired esotopia. We will be discussing the case in the following headings. What is acute acquired concomitant esotopia? As the name suggests, it is acute. It has the same devi uh, deviation in all directions of case with a normal ocular motility. It can be caused by visual deprivation, refractive error, neurological abnormality, and the highlight of this discussion, which is excessive near work, which we have seen drastically in the COVID-19 pandemic in the form of increased screen time. So how would we treat such a condition? We have a choice between Botox and strabismus surgery. Coming to the case, we saw a seven-year-old girl who came to us with sudden onset inward deviation of both eyes and double vision since eight months. She gave a significant history of smartphone use for almost six and a half hours every day in the form of online classes and music lessons, as well as recreational use. On examination of both eyes, the best corrected visual acuity was six by six and six with and without glasses with a cytoplegic refraction of plus one diopter spherical. Stereopsis was 40 arc second and extraocular motility was full and free and painless. The prism bar cover test for near and distance showed 35 prism diopter isotropia, which was common. And on red filter test, there was uncrossed diplopia. The rest of the anterior and posterior segment examination was within normal limits, as well as the examination of the cranial nerves. And there were no cerebral signs. So we came to a working diagnosis of acute acquired comitant esotopia. We did some investigations like the MRI brain and the orthoptic workup, both of which were normal. The old photos of the child confirmed the history and a prism trial was also carried out, but the child was not comfortable. An atropine refraction showed no change in the hyperopia and an intraoperative force duction test turned out to be negative. So why would we use Botox to manage this case? Because it is convenient, minimal time is required. It is simple, cost-effective. There is minimal trauma and pain. And the outcomes are comparable to surgical correction. 
but we could use surgery in some cases. Then it is useful in long-standing cases with large angle deviations. And we must remember that the effect of Botox is temporary. The skin can recur. And also the dose response curve of Botox is not always predictable. And the patient needs multiple visits for repeated injections. So in our case, we gave 3.5 international units of Botox in both eyes medial rectus. So here we have a video. Uh, a phonics based nick was made and the medial rectus muscle was isolated. The conjunctiva was also retracted. Following this, injection Botox 3.5 international units was taken in a tuberculin syringe and with a 30 gauge needle, it was injected directly in the muscle belly. So here we have the child pre Botox injection. And we have the child post-Botox injection. We see that the child is orthotropic and remains so at the fourth month follow-up. So we know that increased screen time is a bane and it has ocular and systemic side effects. Ocular, as we saw, AAC. And in today's age, there is digital eye strain and dry eye. Systemic could be stress, anxiety, sleep disturbances, cardiac issues. So the take-home message from my presentation is that screen time has to be reduced because increased screen time and excessive mere work can produce AAC. And we do not always need surgical correction. Botox is a successful alternative. And most importantly, lifestyle modification. Children need to be encouraged to have increased outdoor activity as well as better sleep pattern. Okay. It was a nice presentation, doctor. Thank you, sir. And uh, now over to judges. Uh, hi, Dr. Mizla. Great presentation. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, this is something we all uh, saw a lot of uh, during COVID period. And uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, cases which were operated as well. And I think Botox is a very safe and a, a different uh, take on it. And it's been very successful. So I do agree with you. Yes, uh, I don't have any other questions. Just, just comment that uh, it's a good option. So we should go ahead. Um, and of course, you mentioned lifestyle uh, changes, which is very, very yes, important. Sir. Yes. Great. Good, good uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, just uh, wanted to, uh, are, what are the other uh, treatment options apart, uh, apart from the Botox in this uh, these cases? So we gave the child a PRISM trial. But the child was not comfortable. So, uh, we, could, uh, so we can do Botox or we can do surgery, sir. In case of surgery, we would uh, either do a bimedial resection, recession, or we would do a unilateral uh, medial rectus recession and lateral rectus resection. And uh, sir, we can also combine Botox along with strabismus surgery. Like we can uh, inject Botox to paralyze the muscle as well as we can do a recession, resection of whichever other muscle that we are operating on. So uh, the patient, uh... In the clinical picture, it was mostly uh, left eye uh, going into esotropia. So, uh, but you told it is a committent squint. Yes, sir. So, sir, uh, there should be, the, uh, like, uh, while presenting, then uh, there, there should be a clinical picture to prove your point because now we have to take uh, your word for the. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Sorry, the nine gaze image yeah. was not available, but yeah. uh, yes, sir. Yeah. The so extracular yeah, motility was uh, full. Full, full, and uh, it was full committent squint. Yes. Committent squint only. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Digbir, sir, any comment? Because your area of expertise also. I think, sir, is not there. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Sir. Just yeah, yes. trying to unmute only. Hello. Yes, sir. I'm still not unmuted, huh? Hello. Sir, you are unmuted, sir. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Sir, your button is still stuck. Can you hear me, guys? Sir, your voice is... Sir, slight echo. Yeah, slight echo, sir. Otherwise, we are able to hear you. Yeah, no, I think so. So I think it's overall a good case. The important thing to you know remember is that uh, in these kind of uh, acute concomitant isotropias, one doesn't have to jump into surgery. That really is uh, our uh, kind of last option because no good resolve if they are because of the kind of a cognitive spasms that we have. 
but otherwise it's well presented and obviously uh, you know more follow up would be required because there's sometimes also you have to rule out uh, you know cyclic forms of ethiopia which may suddenly show as cute concomitant one fine day yeah. and then appear normal another couple of days later but yeah good presentation thank you sir thank you any other questions from the other panelists any comments i have few queries yes sir mrudulla can you show me the uh, slide in which there was a uh, measure i mean prism adapter uh, you showed right can you show, show that slide yes sir one minute sir yes sir yeah in this you have mentioned that uh, there is a stereo piece of uh, 40 arc seconds yes sir you have mentioned the patient is having diplopia yes sir so can you explain that sir uh, um sir on red free test red free test the child had uncrossed diplopia sir uh, no, but on i mean if the patient is having diplopia it means that the patient is not able to fuse right yes sir so how come he is having a stereopsis so the vision is the same in both eyes and it is an alternating uh, pattern so and it's an alternating you're not comitant. getting the point you're not getting the point if the patient is having squint yes sir so he, he won't be able to fuse right yes both sir both the images yes sir so how come he's having a stereo i mean is having stereopsis or not my question is that you mentioned here so the patient is 40 arc seconds is borderline stereopsis yeah how did you measure stereopsis dr sujit is coming to ask how did you measure yeah, stereopsis if the patient is having diplopia he won't be having stereopsis that i'm asking you and the second thing i wanted to know uh, what was the cycloplegic agent you, which you have used so we carried out an atropine refraction sir atropine refraction with yes, that sir. you you have got a plus one yes uh, sir yes sir right yes sir. and uh, what about the rest of the orthoptic evaluation like so it was, was the, uh, within uh, normal limits sir there was no evidence retinoscopy. sir dynamic retinoscopy have you performed in this child no sir orthoptic yeah. evaluation was done sir. yeah that's what in orthoptic evaluation uh, in shankara i think you will do all the uh, this thing right Post posture relative accommodation negative relative accommodation accommodative facility you ah, have yes, worked sheet i guess yes sir yes sir. yes sir. yeah in that everything would have been done yes sir it was within normal limits sir okay and uh, was the trial of patching uh, done in this patient so yes sir. prism trial was done sir no no prior to prism trial because uh, this this might have occurred because of the excess of excessive near near strain yes, so sir. was the trial of patching uh, tried in this patient my, my i am asking this question mainly because stereopsis of 40 seconds of arc if the if the child is able to fuse even intermittently that yes, patching sir. might have uh, broken the accommodation whatever that is happening yes sir near strain whatever near spasms might be happening that it might have broken that so have you tried the try patching this patient uh sir the child was using uh, glasses sir not patching Gla glasses uh, of uh, plus one diopter spherical sir okay it didn't relax the isotropia uh, no sir okay and even prism glasses he was not comfortable not comfortable sir okay maybe i mean in this case you might have tried patching um, say for a week or two weeks before uh, going to botox yes sir. if if at all he had a stereopsis as you have mentioned yes sir that might have might might be i don't i won't say it would have uh, done but it might yes, have uh, uh, best management but botox is also a good line of management only in one eye you are given right in both that to botox so both eyes uh, medial rectus sir 3.5 mm -hmm. internal okay in both eyes you have given yes sir okay okay after botox you haven't measured the these things orthoptic work up and rest of the examination you haven't done right uh, no sir okay okay yes, yes. that's all. thank you sir okay it's Yeah. yeah wonderful questions from dr sujit it gave us a good information next can you mount the next participant dr aishwarya yes sir shall i uh, share my screen sir yeah you can start sharing your screen
Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, your screen is visible. Okay, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Aishwarya Anandi from I Foundation, second year DNB resident. Today, I'll be presenting a case of atypical choroidal melanoma. An 49-year-old male patient presented with a chief complaint of progressive decrease in vision in the right eye for the past three months. Patient gave an history of significant weight loss over the past six months. No other significant positive history was noted in this patient. His general and systemic examination were within normal limits. On ocular examination, right eye had an bis-corrected visual acuity of 6 by 24 and left eye had 6 by 12. Anterior segment examination of both eyes was normal. Fundus examination of the right eye showed a mass lesion whose morphology and extent could not be made out clearly due to the surrounding subretinal fluid with the associated exudative RD and the left eye showed a macular scar. This is the fundus image of both the eyes. Fundus image of the right eye showing a mass lesion in the temporal quadrant whose morphology could not be made out clearly. This is the multicolor photography of the same patient. And B scan was done for this patient, which showed a dome shaped mass lesion with homogeneous echogenicity with low to moderate internal reflectivity with a line echo of moderate internal reflectivity uh, attached to the disc, suggestive of an uh, exudative retinal detachment secondary to the choroidal mass lesion. OCT was done for this patient, which showed a large choroidal elevation with subretinal fluid causing foveal detachment. Fundus autofluorescence showed an hypoautofluorescent lesion in the superotemporal quadrant. Fundus fluorescent angiography was done, which showed an hypofluorescent elevated lesion in the superotemporal quadrant with hypofluorescence in the borders. Investigations was done for the left eye, which showed a macular scar. So why this case? This case gave us a diagnostic dilemma because the investigations, what we had done for this uh, patient, did not have typical choroidal melanoma features. It did not show uh, choroidal excavation. The typical cholestered appearance and acoustic hollowing was not present. And fundus fluorescent angiography did not show in dual circulation. Hence, we came up with a provisional diagnosis of choroidal melanoma or in choroidal hemangioma with associated exudative retinal detachment in the right eye and in left eye macular scar. We ordered for further investigations. MRI and PET scan was ordered. Systemic uh, investigations was ordered for this patient and patient was referred to an oncologist. MRI was done and it showed a T1 hyperintense lesion, which was consistent with choroidal melanoma and it showed no obvious infiltration beyond the sclera. PET scan was done, which showed no evidence of metabolically active lesion elsewhere in the body. Hence, a final diagnosis of a large-sized choroidal melanoma with exudative retinal detachment with no nodular involvement and no systemic metastasis was made and the left eye macular scar status was present. The next challenge we faced in this case was the dilemma in the treatment plan. Being the seeing eye with good vision and considering the macular scar status of the other eye, the following treatment options were considered for this patient. The first one was plaque brachytherapy and the second one was enucleation. So uh, this case was presented in the tumor board and uh, uh, ocular oncologist and the, uh, several oncologists opinion were obtained. And considering the size of the tumor and thickness and the apical height of the tumor, the best treatment solution which was uh, correct for this patient was enucleation. COMS study also suggests uh, enucleation for this size of tumor. Hence, we went ahead with the enucleation and HPE turned out to show a high nuclear grade choroidal melanoma. And to our surprise, there was a transcleral breach which was noted on HPE and which was not picked up on the MRI. And uh, predominant type B spindle-shaped cells was noted on the HPE. So the next treatment plan for this patient was the external beam radiotherapy for the transcleral breach. The patient has completed the external beam radiotherapy and reviewed with us. And for the cosmetic purpose, we had provided him with the prosthesis. So this is the post-op uh, image of the patient now. So what next for this patient? Tight surveillance is needed for this patient, six monthly or an annual follow-up, 
and systemic evaluation to look for meds is needed for this patient because five year relative survival rate for large sized choroidal melanoma is only 47%. Take home message from this case is high clinical suspicion is required. Uveal melanomas can have a typical and atypical features. It has to be differentiated from a choro uh, choroidal navi. Multidisciplinary approach is needed for these kind of cases. Long term follow up and tight surveillance post the primary post primary treatment is also required. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aishwarya. Can we have the judges' comments, please? Yeah. Uh, nice case, Dr. Ashwarya. Uh, actually, uh, is there any hypothesis on uh, what happened in the other eye? Why macular scar in the other eye? Uh, so, uh, that uh, could not be made out clearly. Yeah, Because uh, clinically, if uh, a patient like this comes, uh, yes, I think uh, with uh, one eye macular scar, other eye exudative RD, with such a large okay, uh, tubercle, sometimes uh, some uh, the large mass, some, yeah. the first diagnosis that comes in mind is the choroidal tubercle okay, that, sir. Uh, that is in both eyes. So uh, uh, why directly it went to choroidal melanoma? Uh, what were the differential diagnosis at that time? Like uh, for a PG case, case presentation, we have to uh, work in differentials. Yes, so sir. what were the differentials? differentials? Uh, the differential diagnosis uh, uh, initially, any if there is only a choroidal mass lesion only without associated subretinal fluid or uh, uh, detachments, uh, then the suspicion would be an choroidal nevus. Uh, the next differential would be an uh, choroidal hemangioma, sir. And melanocytoma can also be in differential. Uh, circumscribed choroidal hemangioma uh, can be in differential, sir. So investigations can be done to differentiate it, sir. And to differentiate between a choroidal navi and choroidal melanoma, uh, uh, we'll have to look for certain features, sir. Uh, the growth rate, the thickness, if there is any associated uh, fluid uh, collection, if there is any uh, pigment deposition, if it is associated with drusen, then it is more uh, likely to be a navi. And if there is a surrounding hypopigmentation, uh, then also it is more likely to be a navi than a choroidal melanoma. Uh, and if there is more of orangish pigment deposition, which can be in lipofusion deposition, which is more suggestive of a choroidal melanoma. So these are the clinical features which will help to differentiate between a uh, choroidal melanoma and uh, nevisa. And to differentiate between uh, hemangioma and uh, choroidal melanoma, uh, uh, investigations will be helpful in differentiating it. Sir. Uh, there will be uh, acoustic solidity in case of a choroidal uh, hemangioma. But there will be uh, low internal reflectivity in case of a choroidal uh, melanoma, sir. And MRI would be MRI with contrast will uh, help to differentiate easily between a choroidal melanoma and hemangioma, sir. Okay, uh, Doctor Aditya, I think he wanted yeah. to ask. Him. Yes, um, a nice presentation, Ishwarya. Thank you, sir. Uh, this one quick question: Why didn't you try radiation before you thought of enucleation? Isn't that also uh, the norm to try radiation first and then do enucleation? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, COMS study has also uh, done a study based on this, sir, for a large sized uh, choroidal melanoma, pre uh, pre enucleation radiotherapy and enucleation for one group, and the other group underwent only enucleation only. And there was no significant difference between the two groups, sir, uh, as per the COMS study. Uh, it, uh, even the five year and 10 year mar mortality rate showed no big difference. So it has been uh, uh, documented in COMS study that... Uh, Isn't that more reason to try radiation first if there's no difference? Because... It... Uh, is, but uh, considering the huge size of the tumor, uh, yeah, it was... The and the risk month. of meds would be more... Uh, mm -hmm. Rather than waiting, it would be better to get rid of How the How would you tumor. treat if it was, say, a smaller sized uh, or a medium sized one? Any uh, medications you've heard of uh, which are doing pretty well with uh, melanomas? Uh, Transpupillary, uh, initially as per the COMS study, it was being observed only, sir. But right now, observation is not being done because the risk of uh, metastasis is more uh, with observation. Is there and chemo radiation available for melanomas? Uh, All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, dear judges. Uh, can we have our next presentation, Dr. Kajishri? Yes. Do, do we have Dr. Nirajan? Let us ask if there are any questions from the panelists. 
uh, panelists, do we have any questions for our participant, Dr. Aishwarya? I think we can, yeah, it's fine. Okay, sir. Thank you, dear judges and panelists. Let's move on to our next presentation for the day, Dr. Gajeshri with her case report. Uh, shall I start? Uh, sir? Yes, your screen's visible, doctor. You may start. Uh, good evening to Anand all present here. I'm here to present a case of periocular swelling with asthma. A 60 years old male came with a complaint of bilateral periorbital swelling for six years, which is causing cosmetic concern to the patient. He is a known case of bronchial asthma for eight years and allergic rhinosinusitis for five years. Uh, his base corrected visual acuity was 66 and uh, color vision contrast uh, were normal in both eyes. Uh, extraocular movement were full and free in the left eye and minimal limitation were noted in the right eye. Uh, on local examination, a superiorly uh, firm yellowish non-tender mass present in the both the orbit, uh, superior respect, right more than left. Pupillary reaction and fundus examination were with the normal limit. Systemic examination revealed there were no organomegaly and lymphadenopathy. With this, keeping this feature in the mind, uh, we came to the differential diagnosis of Graves' ophthalmopathy, uh, which is ruled out by thyroid profile and anti-TPO, and there is no lit signs or any other signs of thyroid uh, orbitopathy. And adult on this anthogranuloma, uh, which again is confirmed by a uh, biopsy, non-specific orbital inflammatory disease, it contains an other feature also, dacroadenitis, congestion, and other things. And it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, other one is Langerhans histiocytosis. In this, multisystem involvement will be there, and uh, lymphoma and rosens Doffman uh, disease. Both of them, lymphadenopathy will be there and multisystem involvement will be there. And there is, since there is no lymphadenopathy in our case, we ruled out this also. Uh, we did all this routine investigation and that were found to be normal in this patient and lipid profile were normal. Uh, uh, serum protein electrophoresis and IgV levels were also normal in this case. And we go on with the CT of uh, this patient. CT orbit revealed bilateral preceptal soft tissue thickening. It was noted uh, uh, soft tissue thickening uh, right over the left in both eyes with thickened extraocular muscle. And this MRI picture showed a T2 weighted uh, showing um, soft tissue thickening in the anterior to the uh, orbital septum and heterogeneous intensity over the extraocular muscle. And we go on with the incisional biopsy taken from the right eye up, uh, swelling over the upper lid. Uh, that show the presence of characteristic Tauten Jain cell with lymphocytic infiltrate. This confirms the diagnosis of uh, adults under xanthogranuloma disease. We started the patient on oral steroids since there was no standard protocol uh, treatment protocol for this condition. And one milligram per kilogram body weight uh, we started. And the swelling started reducing and completely reduced after three months of systemic steroids. We stopped with the uh, slow tapering. Within two weeks of uh, stopping our show of steroids, uh, again the patient recurred with the swelling. We started the patient on tablet methotrexate, 10 milligram, along with the low dose steroids. Uh, started for uh, two months. Uh, after two months, the uh, swelling was completely reduced, and the patient is under regular follow. And uh, it's uh, uh, like till now the patient is under follow for past six months. Why this case? Because it's an adult on the xanthogranuloma is an idiopathic inflammatory disease characterized by localized or a systemic proliferation of non-Langerhans Jain cell. It has a four subtypes. Uh, the subtype division is very important because uh, adult on xanthogranuloma subtype is isolated only to the anterior orbit. No other systemic involvement is there. The second one is our case. There is a uh, asthma and sinusitis are associated with it, along with that lymphoproliferative disorder and my, um, IgG related disease are associated with this condition. And third one is a necrobiotic xanthogranuloma that is characterized by subcutaneous nodule that tend to ulcerate and fibrosis. Third one carries a, a fourth one carries a, a worse prognosis that is Adam Chester's disease. This include a retroperitoneal fibrosis, a retro pleural fibrosis. Uh, as well as a lymphocytic uh, uh, infiltration of the posterior uh, orbit. The term AAPOX was first described by Jagopi as a eyelid and orbital lesion in 1983. And it remains a common entity uh, because only less than 50 cases are reported in the literature. And asthma appeared to at the same time as the uh, periocular swelling uh, manifest. Lymphoproliferative disease and IgG4 related diseases are associated with kind that were ruled out in our case. In adult on the uh, uh, asthma, periocular xanthogramloma, and rhinocytis, uh, if it is present in a uh, certain patient, we can suspect of AAPOX. Biopsy can confirm it. Uh, coming to the conclusion, it's an heterogeneous entity uh, that should prompt a thorough evaluation of the pot uh, for potential systemic association rather than diagnosing the disease itself. Clinical pathological correlation is important for diagnosing and subclassification of this rare condition. Uh, again, ophthalmologists are the first person whom the patient with periocular swelling present. The timely investigation referring them to a concerned specialist is uh, advised. 
that will reduce the patient in getting a debilitated life threatening uh, complication due to this condition thank you thank you dr gajeshri over to the judges for their comments please uh, nice presentation dr gajeshri uh, uh, i just uh, wanted to know uh, what are the uh, because this is a pathological diagnosis rather than clinical because uh, so uh, what are the stains are used uh, in this uh, diagnosis apart from the uh, the regular hne stain uh, sir it was only the uh, um, hne stain was used no other but uh, not used no uh, like theoretically if you uh, go which all stains can be used apart from this sir, immunohistochemistry can be done uh, yeah, to rule out, uh, yes. uh, yeah i see i see can be done and uh, what other treatment options do you feel uh, uh, if uh, this uh, oral prednisolone was not working what other uh, uh, options sir, are there uh, there was no standard protocol till now and um, everybody is trying uh, the thing they have used in the previous literature were oral steroids peri ocular steroid intralesional steroids and immunomodulator out of that methotrexate has been tried in previous 2 uh, 3 literature mm -hmm. and uh, uh, rituximab has been tried in extreme cases where there is a, a severe uh, recurrence were there uh, uh, cyclo cyclo cyclophosphamide also i think has been tried at the last extreme we can go for a debulking surgery if it is not resolving good nice thank you sir try it dr avnisha great presentation and uh, nilesh has asked all the right questions Uh, it is a diagnosis of pathology, and uh, the treatment is also very systemic. And uh, often you need uh, dermatologists and you need your uh, uh, physicians to be along with it. So, okay, Doctor Abhishek, has any questions? Uh, no, no, thanks. I think um, most of the questions have been asked. Last time we can ask the panel if there is any. Panelists, are there any questions for a participant? yeah i think this was an interesting case i mean i was something that i think i have not uh, kind of yet come across it's a, it's a rare entity but uh, of these uh, i mean what is kind of the uh, you know uh, the mean age of presentation in adulthood and uh, you know uh, relative to because most of them as we so are in uh, you know in the younger age group so is it usually middle aged people uh, yes sir it's usually middle aged people in our case the patient's age was 60 years Um, mm -hmm. It is usually around thirty to forty. Right. So it was something that the patient kind of realized later, or do you think it developed later as it came along? So it was a slowly progressive. The patient came to multiple hospital. Uh, he, uh, मतलब no uh, treatment has been given, and at last he came to us. Uh, we did. Uh, uh, we like uh, ruling out all the condition, uh, thyroid trouble, and everything. And later on, we came with the conclusion that it could be due to a uh, xanthogranuloma. Right. Indeed, interesting. Yeah, because normally I, we would, I mean, even in the adult onset one, we don't usually expect it to be kind of in the elderly in a way. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, can we'll move on to the next presenter of for the day? Uh, can we have Dr. Priyanka? Yes, Dr. Priyanka. Your screen is visible. Could you please go full screen? Uh, can you hear yeah. me yes yes your screen is visible please go ahead with your presentation yeah. um good evening uh, thanks for the uc team and judges to uh, select my uh, presentation and in finals i'll be presenting a case on double immunosuppression leading to cmv retinitis mm -hmm. so uh, uh, coming to the case details a uh, 37 year old male who came with the complaints of gradual painless progressive diminution of vision in the right eye for two months Associated with uh, redness and floaters in the right eye, there is no other significant past history or uh, any other history in the in the other eye. Uh, no history of any intravitreal injection or any other ocular surgery done before. It's a known case of diabetes mellitus for past two years and regular uh, and is taking regular uh, medications. It's a known case of HIV and uh, on uh, ART treatment for past eight years. is a known case of non hodgkin lymphoma completed uh, chemotherapy of archap regimen four months back and currently now on radiotherapy 
so uh, coming to systemic examination a systemic examination was within normal limits and uh, is uh, was well built and nourished and vitals were stable there is no lymphadenopathy and there is no skin lesions uh, or any lesions in the oral cavity ocular examination of the right eye uh, his vision is 69 which is not improving further and he had a uh, conjectival congestion he had conjectival congestion uh, few pigmented small kps uh, scattered inferiorly over the back of cornea and there was pigments uh, on the anterior lens capsule and the uh, ac reaction was uh, one plus with the uh, retrolental cells present so uh, left eye was with the normal limits and vision uh, vision was 66 six parts including to 66 six. so dilated fundus examination of the right eye showing a uh, grade 1 vitreitis along with a uh, large confluent yellowish area uh, of necrotizing and retinitis just nasal to the disc along with the granular border uh, suggest of active disease in the eye he also had a sclerous vessel that is extending from the disc to the lesion and there are multiple dot bud hemorrhages and microaneurysms in both eyes suggest of moderate npdr so uh, we came to a clinical diagnosis of right eye uh, active cement retinitis in zone 1 along with the uh, grade 1 vitreitis in and both eye moderate npdr with aids and non hodgkin lymphoma so we did a uh, baseline uh, investigations like cbc which uh, which turned out to have a uh, reduced TL, uh, total leukocyte counts that is explainable because of the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and a uh, baseline uh, re uh, renal and liver function tests were within normal limits but the cd4 count was uh, 114 which is not specific to semi retinitis as semi retinitis will have cd4 count of less than 50 ac tap was done and it was positive for cmv so the, the so since it's zone 1 disease which is a sight threatening disease so we went ahead with the ocular ter therapy of intravitreal ganciclovir 2 mg per 0.1 ml twice a week uh, uh, twice uh, in a week along with systemic therapy he was uh, con he was continuing a heart therapy along with uh, intravenous ganciclovir of uh, 5 mg per kg od for two weeks so coming to the discussion a semi retinitis is the most common opportunistic opportun opportun infection in the eye it is a full thickness retinal infection leading to the retinal necrosis, uh, which complicates to retinal breaks and detachments. Uh, CME retinitis is very, very specific to, uh, with uh, CD4 count less than 50 cells per microliter. So the lesion will become uh, active and aggressive on uh, additional uh, systemic immuno immunosuppressions. As in our case, uh, patient was taking chemotherapy, uh, completed chemotherapy, and now on radiotherapy. So the take-home message is that heart uh, therapy leads to reduced HIV replication and elevates the CD4 uh, cell counts, and it also reduces the mortality and morbidity. Uh, this presentation is because of the it can be explained that uh, there is a compromised functionality of the immune uh, immune cells despite the good count. So the even the uh, patient is having uh, more than uh, hundred more than uh, fifty, which is hundred and fourteen. That is because of the functionality of the immune cell, which is lost here. So when to stop the CD4, uh, uh, when to stop the maintenance therapy is when the CD4 count is more than 100 uh, cells for at least three to six months, and when the lesions are inactive. Uh, so the, the patient should come uh, every three months, at, uh, even after uh, stopping maintenance therapy, so that the uh, other complications and other involvement can be prevented. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, before we take questions, uh, over to Dr. Kesh to welcome our uh, chief guest today. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank Dr. Prasanna. And uh, on behalf of Young Optimum Society of India and the organizing team of uh, the uh, case competition today, I welcome Dr. Nirmal Frederick, sir, who is uh, the uh, president elect of TNOA. And uh, he needs actually no introduction. He is a teacher par excellence and an assessor par excellence. He is uh, the chief of NABH uh, accreditation that uh, uh, the assessor committee. And he is owning his own hospital. He is leading the hospital, Nirmal Sai Hospital, uh, which I think is a pinnacle in uh, the OT protocols and uh, everything. So welcome, sir. Welcome to the presentation. And uh, thank you for blessing us. So a few words from you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nilesh. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Yeah. So thank you, Yossi uh, team, for the kind invitation and all the members, uh, <coughs> Dr. Karthikeyan, Dr. Nilesh, Dr. Sethi, Dr. 
டாக்டர் பிரசன்னா அவர் தமிழ்நாடு மெம்பர்ஸ் டாக்டர் பிரசன்னா டாக்டர் நிரஞ்சன் டாக்டர் அபிஜித் சாரி சம் ஜாப் சம் நேம் you are delayed in the theater sorry for joining you late so nice to be part of this uh, initiative so it has a typical tamil name noi nadi so uh, i think the <coughs> it was coined for the tamil nadu team i've been hearing uh, about young ophthalmic society and your work since uh, the last few years and nice you have started the tamil nadu initiative and tamil nadu chapter sure with the young brigade prasanna niranjan and all other things so this state will uh, rock in the young of talmik <coughs> forum as well so noi nadi concept so there are so many uh, good punch lines and uh, tag lines for for our state so it's one thing called namak name that means uh, for us <clears throat> we for us and uh, i think noi nadi is started from uh, noi nadi noi mudal nadi so you have to start with preventive uh, therapy so so many thousands of years back they have started this preventive initiative that not only uh, curative but also preventive uh, part we need to take care so it's a wonderful uh, concept i just uh, heard the last presentation and uh, so starting with the uh, case presentation i think that is where uh, uh, everything starts right from history taking to short presentation so it's basically not only <clears throat> for a passing the exam but also for uh, understanding the patient needs understanding the uh, clinical requirements for the patients and how to approach the uh, patients all these are uh, basic skills you need to learn and unfortunately the basic skills are lacking now particularly because of the non standardized way of medical education as well as uh, too many medical colleges and too many institutions so even though we want to have standardized medical educations but with uh, so much differences in the infrastructure so many differences in the teaching methodology and also the resources so uh, we know many of the regional institute and uh, apex institute have uh, resources on par with western or uh, first world countries whereas some of the medical colleges some of the teaching institutions are uh, Uh, even below par than third world countries so we have a wide range of medical education from <coughs> first class to third class so this is where these kind of programs will really help the youngsters uh, to catch up with their colleagues from the urban or uh, the best teaching institutions so i'm sure uh, uh, yosi will take this uh, initiative to all the medical colleges as well as all these a uh, young ophthalmologists who are coming out from various uh, colleges various backgrounds various teaching institutions even though we want to have the <coughs> standardized uh, teaching curriculum uh, standardization uh, somewhere also makes everybody on par but we need uh, such uh, programs and initiatives where certain creative talents also come into the picture so youngsters i think uh, with the uh, technology coming up in a big way where the old methodology of teaching is nowhere uh, going to be useful right with chat gpt and uh, fourth generation chat gpts and ai coming up i am not sure the regular teaching methodology will really help in any way so the young generation has to adapt not only the traditional method but also <clears throat> the technological initiatives our patients are still uh, particularly the vulnerable and old age patients are still uh, <clears throat> looking for traditional method of clinical examination the touch method and also some kind empathetic words on the extreme their next generation their uh, grand sons or grandchildren and of course the it uh, people are looking for technology solution right from appointment to 
you are patient interactions they want the images beforehand so that they can have third or fourth opinion like that so i think uh, not only the presentations but also how you have to integrate all these technology initiatives into your practice so which we were uh, <clears throat> so when we grew up or when we came into ophthalmology all these were uh, impasse nothing was there so just one uh, set lamp and one trial set was enough to start a practice but now uh, with the technology advances you need to have everything so in the recently so i think where there is a handheld uh, oct right along with handheld fundus uh, camera so these are things that is going to really uh, change the way clinical ophthalmology is uh, practiced but i think the basic is uh, case presentation how you approach the case and uh, how you manage the case and most importantly how you convey that to the patient so this is where uh, the old traditional way and the technology uh, field is going to mix up i'm sure the next uh, decade is going to be uh, <clears throat> your decade because as the old uh, gives way to the new so all this mix of traditional as well as technological initiatives will improve patient interaction doctor patient relationship as well as our outcomes also so generally uh, with my uh, nabh background we not only see the methodology and standardized way of clinical practice but also catching up with the outcomes and uh, benchmarking with the western counterparts is also now becoming uh, important initiatives so apart from presentation you also have to uh, improve your uh, general skills so i come across many young people during my assessment visit to hospitals as well as to the uh, teaching colleges uh, so they <clears throat> generally they have few uh, uh, lacunae um, maybe uh, uh, yosi can uh, uh, link with these teaching institutions as well as uh, see how we can bridge the gap between academia and the industry i feel there is a, a gap there between the academia what you learn in the teaching or medical colleges and what we practice in the <clears throat> practical setup whether it's a large institution or a single specialty hospitals or day care centers so somewhere you have to uh, <clears throat> be aligned to this also so in many uh, other industries there is a, a link or bridge between the academic institutions and the practicing institutions or like manufacturing institutions or uh, the service industries also so same way in ophthalmology also we have to bridge the gap between the teaching institutions and the uh, practicing institutions so so whenever when you start learning itself you know how to uh, practice how I, so you know how to deal with the critical patients how to convey bad news to the patient how to communicate with the patient how to communicate with the attenders the requirements of the medical legal requirements the requirements of accreditations so these are some uh, skills that uh, we find that lack, uh, lacking in the young of the mothers so this kind of initiative outside the uh, teaching forums outside the teaching institutions uh you uh, know friendly atmosphere because you are all in the same age group uh i think it will be a good initiative so young ophthalmic uh, society of india particularly tamil nadu chapter can work with the uh, seniors particularly tamil nadu ophthalmic association which is a vibrant society to see how we can bridge uh, the gap right so we would be happy to be part of uh, uh, such initiative where we can Uh, give you some uh, skills that are lacking, or <clears throat> you can be part of uh, such skill development programs. So not only related to ophthalmology, but also related to entrepreneurship, practice, leadership skills, and now uh, a lot of things coming up <clears throat> in the technology area. A lot of innovations happening. Happening.
I think there is a disconnection. Okay, Dr. Niranjan, can you hear? Niranjan is also disconnected, I believe. Yeah, both are in the same network. Yeah. Fine. We'll wait for a few seconds till Sir comes back. Email the judges. Uh, for can I ask the questions? To, uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Priyanka. Amnisha? Yeah, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Priyanka. I think uh, Dr. Priyanka nicely presented and you have actually uh, elaborated the nuances. Uh, but then again... Uh, I think Dr. Nirmal has come back. Yes, yes. Then I'll hold up. Hey, sorry, I think I got logged out. Yeah. Right, I won't take much of your time. Uh, so these are my uh, uh, thoughts. So we'll be happy to help you and support your initiatives, at least in the Tamil Nadu part of it. And uh, any other uh, initiative, we'll be happy to support you. So my best wishes to all the winners. I think we can wait for a few seconds. So, Professor, now what is the meaning of knowing Nadi? Knowing Nadi means uh, finding the disease. Uh, it's it's from Thirukkural. It's taken from the first line of Thirukkural. First, we have to find a disease. Then you have to find the cause of the disease. Then we have to treat the disease. It's from knowing Nadi. Uh, yes. I think we have Dr. Nirmal back. Sir? Uh, I, I think my I'm not sure what is the problem. Anyway, thanks a lot, guys. <coughs> Am I audible? Ah, yes, yes, sir. sir, sir you're audible. Loud, loud and clear, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So thanks a lot, uh, folks from uh, Young Ophthalmic Society. So carry on with this Noi Nadi. So uh, not only the Noi, but also learn the other skills to detect the Noi so that you can uh, detect as well as uh, treat the Noi before it becomes a bothersome for the patients. So, so all the best for all your initiative. So if uh, we can support any of your initiative, feel free to ask us. We'll be happy to join hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your support and thank you for your time and thank you for your insights. Thank you, sir. Now, over to the judges. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you from the, uh, from, from the side of the core team of uh, UOC as well as the executive members. And... Uh, will definitely be a step forward in actually having a better standard of care for for the uh, for the system thank you so much sir thank you judges uh, can we have any questions from the judges side for uh, yes. dr Pri priyanka's presentation yeah dr priyanka just a quick question like you went, uh, you have said that for after the diagnosis, you have started uh, IV gancyclovir. Uh, do you, how did you follow up the patient uh, after that? And uh, what was the change in strategy of, uh, of your treatment? Because you have made the diagnosis and follow up, you have not mentioned about. Sir, actually, patient, we gave inter intravitreal and gancyclovir for uh, along with intravenous gancyclovir also. And actually, patient is currently on admission only, is not at uh, discharge. So, actually, we are planning to change the intravenous to oral val gansiclovir with the uh, monthly follow up till that uh, uh, immune recovery uh, is seen. And how is the fundus uh, for subsequent follow up? Like, how are you doing it? And, uh, like, how many injections have you given it for the uh, af after the diagnosis? And uh, yeah. as far as the oral gansiclovir is concerned, can you tell me the dosage of it and uh, how how to tell how much do you want to con consider con continuing it? Uh, uh, sir, right now we have given a bi-weekly injection of intravitreal uh, intravitreal uh, gansiclovir for two weeks. Sir. Now we are planning for discharge. Then uh, we will change to oral val gansiclovir of 900 mg. So we'll uh, uh, OD dose will be there, uh, will be continued uh, till uh, till three months at least. Uh, sorry, three weeks till we see the immune recovery. 
Initially, yes, we absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Please, Dr. Uh, so in, uh, so initially, we give followed by the maintenance dose. So we will change the maintenance dose, dose to 900 mg OD. Fine. Fine, fine. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Pranka. Nice presentation. And uh, till uh, when do you uh, want to continue this intravitreal injection? Like, uh, will it continue biweekly till the patient is discharged, or uh, will you increase the uh, frequency, decrease the frequency? So we will give for two weeks, biweekly for two uh, two weeks. Uh, then we will uh, uh, change it to oral medication. Only oral medication? No, you are not going forward with intravitreal uh, after that. If it, if needed, we can give uh, uh, weekly injections uh, till three weeks. Okay, and uh, uh, just a theoretical question: uh, the other options of uh, treatment of CMV retinitis apart from the intravitreal injection? Uh, like force carnitine, sidofovir injection also can be given. And uh, advanced new advances there: intravitreal cancer implant is uh, uh, is there, which is called Vitrasert, but currently not available in India. No, no, it is not available everywhere because that's what I wanted to point out. And February, it has been discontinued. So uh, this, this can be asked because uh, uh, it is not recent advance. It's, it is here uh, since 1996, but it has been discontinued right now because of uh, less demand, I think. So. Thank you, dear judges. If there are no further questions, can we move on to the next presenter for the day? Uh, Dr. Niranjana Balasubramanian. Could you please start your screen sharing? Uh, yes. Could you please go full screen, please? Yes, you may start now. Uh, Dr. Niranjana, uh, you're not audible. Uh, I think still she's not audible. Is anybody else able to hear her? Uh, no, no, Niranjan. Uh, she's not audible. Yeah. Dr. Niranjana, could you please check your mic settings, please? So should we try I to move Pranesh, on to the next presenter? Pranesh knows how to guide. Uh, Pranesh, you are telling something, no? Uh, Oh, presumably, she must have uh, changed the mic settings. I think we can just chat and ask her. Uh, yes, sir. I think that's a good uh, idea. Yeah. Meanwhile, we'll move on to the next presenter uh, by yeah. the time she gets it ready. Can we have Dr. Akshaya yeah. Balaji uh, ready? Dr. Akshaya? Yes, sir. Yes, doctor. Could you, uh, Dr. Niranjana, could you please stop screen sharing? Yes. Dr. Akshaya, could you start your screen sharing, please? Um, am I audible, yeah. sir? Yeah, you're audible. Please go full screen before we start. Yes. You may start. I'm here to press. I'm uh, presenting a case, an unusual case of conjunctival iridocele iridocele melanocytoma. Uh, moving on to the clinical history, the patient is a 22 year old female patient with no known systemic illness, no family history, no history of trauma, and non alcoholic and non smoker. The presenting complaints were painless brownish mass in the left eye, which initially started as a small dot and gradually increased to the current size over the past six years and was associated with diminution of vision in the left eye. 
the past treatment history the patient was diagnosed as a case of left eye post traumatic irises with self sealed corneal perforation with secondary glaucoma patient was put on anti glaucoma medications um, dorzolamide uh, and bremonidine timolol combination and was referred to our center the clinical picture was as follows on ocular examination the right eye showed a vis uh, best corrected visual acuity of 66 uh, where the left eye visual acuity was finger counting at half meters with projection of rays accurate in all four quadrants the iop was uh, 12 mm of mercury in the right eye and left eye was 17 mm of mercury on dorzolamide and uh, timolol bremonidine combination um, on uh, the right eye anterior and the posterior segment was within normal limits uh, moving on to the left eye the uh, clinical picture showed a brownish pigmentary deposit in nasal bulbar conjunctiva with sclerose vessels pigments uh, where depo uh, pigment deposition was seen on the endothelium extending from the limbus nasally anterior chamber was found to be irregular with a nasal peripheral anterior synecae and pigment dispersion on gonioscopy the angle was found to be uh, close with pigment uh, deposition seen from 7 to 11 clock hours there was no evidence of neovascularization of iris the uh, there was uh, there was a nasally shifted irregular pupil because of the uh, peripheral anterior synecae lens uh, was infratemporally subluxated uh, clear lens with uh, nasally stretched zonules and supranasal notching was seen retrolental pigments were visible uh, the on indirect uh, ophthalmoscopy examination there was a dull glow uh, seen due to the media haze dense pigmentary clump was noted uh, disc was within normal limits peripheral retina uh, details were not clearly visible the clinical picture So the first picture shows a brownish black conjunctiva lesion measuring 8.5 cross 7 mm over the bulbar conjunctiva on the nasal side. The second picture shows the irregular anterior chamber with nasal peripheral anterior synecae and a uh, uh, irregular pupil. And the third picture shows a, nas a nasally stretched zonules, irregular anterior chamber, infratemporal subluxated lens, and a supranasal notching. so based on the history and the clinical findings we came up with the following differential diagnosis conjunctival iridociliary melanoma iridociliary melanocytoma adenoma or adenocarcinoma congenital melanocytosis melanosis metastatic lesion iris cyst uh, probably post traumatic foreign body granuloma and implantation cyst Uh, on invest uh, on further investigations the ultrasonogram of the left eye showed a supranasal ciliary body mass of it was a irregular mass of 4.7 cross 8.5 mm without cavitation mild to moderate amplitude uh, spikes were noted in the vitreous cavity as shown in the picture uh, ultra uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy was performed which uh, showed an irregular mass lesion of 4.7 cross 8.5 involving the iris angle ciliary body uh, and also there can be uh, uh, there uh, Uh, infratemporal subluxated lens was noted magnetic resonance imaging both um, contrast and non contrast images were uh, taken Uh, it showed a well uh, defined 4.5 cross 8.5 cross 3 mm uh, t1 uh, hyper intense lesions in the t1 images and the and a high point uh, intense lesion on the t2 images in the medial aspect of the left orbit involving the uvea which was homogeneously enhancing on post contrast images uh, in mri there was no extraocular extension or involvement of the optic nerve impression cytology showed normal conjunctival epithelial cells with numerous goblet cells fine needle aspiration cytology of the left iris body mass showed dense melanocytic pigments with entrapped degenerated cells 18 fluoro deoxy glucose positron emission tomography scan of the whole body was performed which showed irregular subcentimetric enhancing nodular lesions in the supranasal aspect of the left orbit as a site of primary neoplastic pathology uh, with uh, no avid lesion seen elsewhere in the body so we uh, after our investigations we came up to uh, the diagnosis of ciliary body melanoma in the left eye extending to the iris and conjunctiva uh, uh, treatment plan in this case was uh, uh, we continued the anti glaucoma uh, medications to control the intraocular pressure and the and a surgical intervention of conjunctival mass excision with plaque brachytherapy using ruthenium 106 followed by amniotic membrane grafting was done Uh, why we had done uh, planned a pla plaque bracket therapy in this case uh, basically it was uh, based on the age of the patient size and extent of the tumor vision in the affected eye uh, without uh, extra scleral extension and in an intention to salvage the globe we uh, went ahead with the plaque bracket therapy 
and the plaque brachytherapy ruthenium 106 plaque uh, in uh, in conjunction with the radiation oncology department uh, a diameter of 19.8 mm with a scleral dose of 448 grays and uh, dose prescribed was 80 80 gray at 5.9 mm depth uh, for a duration of 66.7 hours the plaque is shown here um, I would just like to The following is a surgical video of the procedure shown. Uh, the tumor, uh, the tumor extent was first marked using gentian violet. The conjunctival mass is excised uh, along with the two, two mm free tumor margin. The Doctor, your video is still not playing, I suppose. Uh, you are now able to see, sir? No, your video is not uh, playing. Um, I think you should. Uh... Yeah, play it in the slideshow itself, oh, I suppose. Uh, I am unable to. Hello, you can see. Uh, just one minute. Now, is it visible, sir? Uh, uh, is it visible now, sir? It's still loading. It's still loading. Yeah, it's visible. Please go ahead. Yes. The uh, surgical video, um, first the tumor extent is marked using gentian violet. And uh, conjunctival mass is excised along with the 2, two mm tumor free margin. The sclera is exposed and then the ruthenium uh, 106 scleral plaque is uh, placed uh, sutured with fibro bond suture to cover the uh, tumor base covering the entire um, tumor base overlapping with the corneoscleral limbus to encompass for the anterior chamber involvement. The plaque was left in situ for the treatment duration of 66.7 hours and then uh, during which the patient was isolated. Then the plaque was removed and a cryo of the tumor base was done and the exposed bare sclera uh, was um, covered with amniotic membrane graft. Uh, the excised conjunctival, uh, the excised conjunctival mass was uh, sent for histopathological examination, which uh, surprisingly relieved highly pigmented tumor with the focal necrosis with increased cytoplasmic pigment, low nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, no atypical ATPI features, and no mitosis. No, Doctor, your screen is still not visible. Of the... so it's visible now, sir. Uh, not yet. So now. Mm. now, sir, it's still loading. Uh... <laughs> now, is it visible? Is it visible now, sir? No, no, not yet. Can we, sir, uh, Karthik, sir, Pranesh, sir, can we uh, have a concluding remarks on this case? Or I think, uh, how many slides are left, Dr. Because yeah. we've exceeded the just time just limit by quite a much. I think it's a conclusion, Doctor. Yeah, you can just... I think it's a Yes. You can conclude without even sharing the presentation, Dr. Akshaya. Uh, okay. Uh, the take-home message is, uh, in this case, we had planned plan, uh, melanocyte and melanoma of the ciliary are difficult to differentiate clinically. Decision-making in such cases depends on the age of the patient, vision in the affected eye, clinical symptoms, and vision-threatening complications associated with, and also the cause of the lesion. Plaque brachytherapy, even if it is not a primary mo treatment modality, is still a viable option as it causes direct treatment of the tumor with minimal scarring, greater penetration, lesser risk of secondary malignancy, and shorter duration of treatment. However, it requires a bi big task force, expensive setup, and a precise measurement of extent of tumor with local uh, side effects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akshaya.
uh, can we have the comments from the judges please uh, hi aksha i have a question uh, what are the factors that will influence uh, your therapeutic uh, decision making whenever you look at a case like this and what are the other options of treatment that you would uh, think of before going ahead sir in uh, this particular uh, case uh, or generally your asking sir oh. uh, in um, melanocytoma of the uh, ciliary body as such uh, in small non progressive lesions then observation uh, with close follow up can be done second options are surgical resection options sclero uveectomy sectoral iridectomy uh, can be done and for larger tumors e nucleation uh, is done in radiotherapy uh, apart from plaque brachytherapy uh, charged particle radiation therapy is also uh, possible sir so size is the most important factor that will decide on your treatment that's yes it? yes okay sir and what what in the plaque what uh, what uh, what do you have in the plaque so beta emitter in this particular case ruthenium 106 was used which is a, had a beta emitter and other gamma emitters are also available iodine 125 cobalt 60 and also any surgical so, option also are there any surgical sir? options also any new surgical options also available okay thank you hi dr aksha nice presentation and uh, don't get disheartened by the technical glitch uh, it happens so uh, the question that i wanted to ask is uh, you said fnsc was taken so how was the fnsc sample taken using a 30 gauge needle from the um, left iridociliary bone mass the fluid was aspirated and sent for uh, cytoscopic examinations it was taken intraocularly it was not taken from the uh, any other site it was not taken from because usually in uh, uvel melanoma the uh, where is the site of fnsc where should it be taken from so in this they are taken from the uh, uh, iridociliary mass only no 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 uh, otherwise like uh, what is the protocol it from where it should... we take it from the lesion uh, the, the uh, location F of the lesion only the fnsc should only be taken as a sentinel lymph node biopsy it should only be done from the uh, if there is a lymphatic uh, involvement at extension that is suspected and should be taken from a place where the lymph node is palpable so lymphadenopathy if it is there it has to be taken from the sentinel lymph node uh, i'm not sure if uh, it is advised because you are breaching the uh, breaching the uh, mass and the risk of extension then goes okay so uh, uh, dr avnish sir uh, am i correct or Yes, sir. Can the panelist? Uh, yeah. Step in. Anyone and... from the panelist have any comment? Ah, uh, doctor. Sir, when was the FNC done? Was the FNC done prior to PET scan or was it done after PET scan? I mean, it was done after the after the PET scans. Okay, in the PET scan report, I think you have uh, written non-FTG uptake. I mean, routinely there is cutoff values for uh, malignancies, right? In PET scan. So was the uptake more than that cutoff value? Sorry, sir, I didn't get you. I mean, usually metabolically active tissues uptake the DG in PET scan, yes, and yes, malignant tissues will take more than the required dose. So was was this was this lesion taking more than the required value? I exactly don't remember the value. It is either ten or fifty. I don't remember exact value. uh was it reaching it that it was not about the cut off it was not about the cut off uh, values sir okay and uh, as it was only melanoma so what you when, when you were doing fnc were you suspecting in the malignant uh, lesion or you were uh, suspecting a benign lesion we were suspecting malignant lesions malignant lesion okay and in the fnc report uh, i think you have written there were a few pigment uh, clumps and Yes, it was inconclusive. And inconclusive. It degenerated uh, cells were entered. Yes. Okay. And pigment clumps. You, you noticed few pigment clumps, right? Yes, sir. 
Awesome. Then when you came to management, uh, you you right away jump. I mean, but since the PET scan was not conclusive conclusive of malignancy, and since FNAC also didn't show any uh, atypical cells or malignant cells, uh, why? I mean, the patient is also an adult. It's not like a child who you have to go for a single sitting. You can't go for a two sitting. Since the patient is an adult, twenty-two year old, why don't you plan for a staged up- approach? Like you could have gone for a biopsy and see the and have seen the report uh, whether it is ben- really benign or malignant. Since it's a melanocytoma, I think you could have observed instead of going trash straight away, going uh, for excision and. Uh, it was progressively play- increasing in size over the. Sir, it was progressively increasing in size uh, for six years, and clinically, uh, it appeared uh, like a um, lesion. Okay, for that reason, you have uh, placed the plaque black therapy, right? When was the last follow-up of this yes. patient? So three months follow-up, uh, the size of the lesion had uh, reduced to three cross one point five seven meters. Okay, it is regressing. Half now. the size it has reduced, and the vision. Okay. Yes, sir. And in the management part, and vision uh, also was single count. You uh, expose the sclera and uh, taken out the mass, right, from the ciliary body and iris, and placed a plaque bag, uh, like plaque over that. So only the conjunctival mass excised and the okay. brachytherapy was placed. Directly and placed then, over uh, the sclera. Six point seven. Yes, sir. Over the sclera, the overlapping the corneal uh, sclera. The sclera was bare. I mean, uh, was Actually, the uveal tissue exposed or uveal tissue was not exposed? Not exposed, sir. Okay, it was not exposed. Not exposed, sir. Only the conjunctival mass. So the pigmentation, was the pigmentation was extending uh, up to sclera, sclera. I mean, sclera, yes, scleral level. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there was a uh, extra scleral extension up to conjunctiva then. Yes. Sir. Right. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay, that's all. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think Dr. Niranjana is ready with her. Uh, Mic settings corrected, Dr. Narendra, are you there? Can you hear me now, sir? Yeah, it's much better. Uh, so we'll go ahead with her presentation, dear judges. Can we have your slide share, please? Yes, sir. Sure. Please go full okay. screen. Yeah, yes, sir. we may start. A very good evening, everyone, and Dr. Narendra Nam Balasubramanian. I'll be sharing a very peculiar case which we encountered. Parts planar glaucoma drainage tube obstruction by posterior lens capsule in a case of ICE syndrome and its timely rescue by ND Aglisa. A brief clinical history, a 44-year-old female with no systemic illness and no family history of ocular morbidities, presented with sudden onset blurring of vision and watering for the past 20 days in left eye. She was hailing from a neighboring state and she was diagnosed to have PACS in right eye and chronic angle closure glaucoma in left eye and she had already undergone laser iridotomy. The documented baseline findings include intraocular pressure of 12 and 34 and cup disc ratio of 0.3 and 0.7 in right and left eye respectively. She has had multiple episodes of pain, redness and blurring in left eye over the past one year with no documented evidence of anterior segment inflammation. The current medications in left eye include topical bimetopros, fixedra combination of primonidin and temelot. The patient was already started in systemic estazolamide a week before, and she was referred to us for the management. At presentation, her clinical findings included pest corrected visual activity of 6 6 in both eyes and intraocular pressures of 12 and 20 in right and left eye. The significant clinical findings in right eye include more than 180 degree propositional closure and gonioscopy with presence of patent iridotomy at two sites, and she has had normal fundus and visual fields in right eye. In her left eye, she had more than uh, around 360 degree of spinacular closure, which was evident in gonioscopy, and there was diffuse stromal atrophy, and there was presence of patent iridotomy at three sites. Her pupillary reactions were sluggish, and she's had advanced cupping of 0.85 with concentric thinning of neuroretinal ramp. And her visual fields revealed a ring scotoma without involving the central fixation. And the diagnosis was right eye primary angle closure suspect post iridotomy and in left eye secondary angle closure glaucoma due to iridocornea endothelial syndrome with clinical picture mimicking essential iris atrophy variant. As she was referred for further management, we had decided to go ahead with glaucoma drainage device in the vitreous cavity. 
The reason behind this decision was the presence of advanced disc damage and the patient was already on three topical medications in systemic astrozolomide. There was definite clinical evidence of progression over the last one year and she was not affording medications and she was very symptomatic. The reason for placing the tube in vitreous cavity rather than anterior chambers or in the sulcus was due to the presence of critically shallow anterior chambers with extensive sinicae and clear lens status. So a supratemporal RD implantation with the tube in the vitreous cavity was done. And this is the postoperative image of the patient. RD being a non valve device, we decided to do ab externo ligature with 6O vital suture. And the postoperative events, at day two, she had well-formed anterior chambers and her intraocular pressure, as expected, was on the higher side as the tube was temporarily occluded by ligature. So we decided to continue the anti-glaucoma medication. The patient reviewed to us at week seven, a week before her actual review day, because she had noticed mild blurring of vision in the left eye. On examination, she had shallow chambers with intraocular pressure of tube. And the tube was well visualized in the posterior segment. There was isle of folds, the macula, there's no choroidal effusion. The reason for this being the absorption of the tube ligature, which usually happens between five to seven weeks, would have contributed to this hypotony. So we decided to do conservative management and we stopped the glaucoma medications. On subsequent follow-ups, we found a well-formed anterior chamber and intraocular pressures were maintained at low teens of medications. She was following up at her local place. And after one and a half years of her primary surgery, she had underwent phagoemulsification uh, due to progression of cataract in her left eye. And on one fine day, she again presented to us with sudden also drop in vision and watering in left eye. And her best corrected visual activity was 1 by 60 and her pressures were 40. And the patient was already started on medical therapy. This was one month post cataract surgery. On examination, we found diffuse corneal edema, well formed in quiet anterior chambers, well centered posterior chamber IOL. And the B scan was known. So when we further explore the cause for this unexplained ocular hypertension, we found that the RD tube tip was occluded by the posterior lens capsule. The PC folds in this image show that the actual culprit was a tube capsular obstruction. So what was the management plan? We decided to do a focal YAC posterior capsule autonomy to relieve the obstruction. And as indicated in these images, the focal obstruction at the tube tip was relieved after capsular capsulotomy and her vision improved to 6 by 60 on the next day and her pressure was dropped to 10 and hence the DM folds. The eye hole was well centered and the tube tip was free of occlusion. And to discuss, the primary implantation of tube in vitreous cavity serves multiple advantages in scenarios like this, primarily for IOP control and fake eyes with glaucoma secondary to eye syndrome as it is emerging as a primary Last indication. 10 seconds, doctor. Kindly wind there up. Is, yes, sir. The risk of worsening corneal endothelial loss in tube, tube migrations and retractions contribute to acquisition failure. Hence, tube occlusion by capsule should be treated with NDI capsulotomy. So the learning points from this case is tube capsular obstruction can be successfully managed by NDI laser. Tubes placed in sulcus or vitreous cavity should be of adequate length to allow visualization. Not to forget basics, there should be appropriate distance of the entry site in phakic, pseudophakic and aphakic eyes to avoid proximity. And sulcus placement should be positioned well beyond the excess margin. And in case of position in the vitreous cavity, we will can be placed posterior to avoid closer entry to the lens capsule. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Niranjana. Can we have uh, the comments from the judges, please? Hi, uh, Niranjana. Great presentation. Um, one quick uh, question. What is the first line treatment for eye syndrome generally? So it depends on what is the presentation and what is the clinical variant of it. In cases with Chandler syndrome, it usually presents with uh, corneal edema and the uh, con uh, co corneal factors contribute to it. It's in cases with iris atrophy, there'll be more chances of glaucomatous progression. So in cases when the glaucoma progresses despite the medical management, usually these are refractory cases and more chances for trabeculectomy to fail because of progression of the abnormal endothelium blocking the osteums. So yeah, GDDs are emerging as a primary treatment option when the medical management fails. 
so primary is surgical or is you prefer medical first and then go for surgical or the other way around so primarily we start with medical management but eventually we see that most of the cases are refractory to medical therapy and ultimately end with uh, is, is surgical option. for uh, both your filtering surgery as well as your uh, tubes to get uh, obstructed in uh, yeah. yes in is that is that, that is exactly that? sir the tube obstruction not only obstruction these ice membrane can cause retraction and migration of the tubes and hence, we pre in case if the cataract is significant, we prefer to do cataract extraction and place a tube in the ciliary mm -hmm. sulcus so that it stays. Did you do any investigation to figure out if this capsular touch was the reason for the tube to get obstructed? So the or clinical that caps opened it up. Is that the reason why? So, uh, so as uh, the clinical picture improved immediately after the capsule obstruction was released, it was clinically convincing enough to say that the tube. Uh, capsule obstruction was contributing to the increased IOP and we immediately saw a lowering of intraocular pressures so the very next day. You think doing the YAG capsulotomy opened it, that's why the uh, the touching of the posterior capsule to the tube was the reason of blockage. That's correct? Yes, sir. There was yes, sir, definitely. So uh, in your YAG capsulotomy, you did not touch the tube at all? Is that a possibility? So there are chances for uh, tube uh, touch, but uh, in this case, uh, there was no tube touch, sir. With low energy shots, it immediately released the capsule upstairs. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Are there any other comments from other judges or panelists? I think uh, we are good to go. All the questions okay. were asked. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we have next up Dr. Hemant. Dr. Hemant with his case report. Yes, Dr. Heyman. Could you please start your screen sharing? Yes, sir. Yes. Is my screen seen, sir? Uh, please go full screen. Now, it, yes, yes. It's seen, sir. You may start now. Good evening, everybody. Today I'll be presenting a case of uh, an arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which was an initial presentation in a case of Takaiso Ioto arteritis. Again, then coming to the case history, 34 year old female, uh, like who was a homemaker by occupation, presented with the complaints of sudden onset painful loss of vision, uh, like in the left eye for the past four days, which was also associated with left sided temporal headache since two days, and it was also associated with painful jaw movements on chewing. And there was no history of any limb weakness or any bowel or uh, bladder disturbances. And then she was a known type 2 diabetic who, who was on dietary, uh, dietary control. And then she was not a known case of any hypertension or any CAD. And then coming to examination, like on general physical examination, it was found to have a significant pallor. And then on examination of the right eye, vision was 6 by 6. And there was no evidence of any cells or, uh, cells or flare in the anterior chamber. And there was no any evidence of neovascularization. Uh, of iris, and then the pupil showed uh, like three mm, and then the direct re uh, reaction was brisk, whereas uh, the consensual was sluggish, and then IOP was within normal limits, and then the color vision and contrast sensitivity were within normal limits. And then coming to the ocular examination of the left eye, uh, the visual acuity was finger counting close to face, and then the projection of rays was accurate, and then there was no evidence of any cells or fear in anterior chamber, and then there was no evidence of neovascularization of iris. And then the pupils revealed uh, grade 3 RIPD and then IOP was within normal limits and then color vision and contrast sensitivity could not be elicited. Then coming to the posterior segment, the right eye media was clear, disc was mildly hyperemic and then the cup disc ratio was 0 0.2 is to 1 which showed a disc at risk features and then artery is to venous ratio was 2 is to 4. There was mild dilatation associated with minimal torsicity of the veins and then the foveal reflex was sharp. And then coming to the left eye, Left eye, uh, left eye, the media was clear, and then the disc showed uh, pale disc edema, and then CDA could not be made out, and then there was associated venous dilatation and minimal torticity, and the foveal reflex was sharp. And then coming to the fundus fluorescent angiography, left eye showed segmental filling defects of the disc and the adjacent choroid, which was uh, which was suggestive of ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, with uh, the microaneurysms. Uh, uh, scattered throughout the fundus in both the eyes, which was suggestive of Takaiso retinopathy. Uh, and then retrospectively, when we 
examined for the blood pressures, there was more than 10 mm Hg of difference in the blood pressure in between the upper limb and the lower limb. And then when we examined for the pulses, she was found to have feeble bilateral radial pulses. Uh, like and then coming to workup and the management, her ESR and then CRP leukocytes and the platelet counts were uh, significantly elevated. Uh, like on immunology workup, she was found to have ANA and ANCA were negative. And then MR angiogram confirmed the diagnosis of Takayasu aorta arteritis. And then the case was diagnosed as Takayasu aorta arteritis. And then the therapy was initiated with high dose intravitreal methyl prednisolone for three days, which was followed by slow tapering of oral prednisolone with the uh, immunomodulators. The follow-up status was literally at around one month, the visual activity in the left eye was still found to be finger coating close to face. And then the pupils had grade three RAPD, but the fundus was showing resolving disc edema. And then coming to the discussion, Takai saw aorta arteritis with idiopathic obstructive arteritis of large and medium sized arteries. And then this patient fulfills three out of the six uh, criteria, which was uh, uh, described by American College of Rheumatology. That is age was less than 40 years. And then she had bilateral feeble radial pulses. And then the difference in BP in between upper and lower limb was more than 10 mmHg. So actually, arteritic AON is an uncommon manifestation of Takai's aorta arteritis, as uh, most of the arteritic AON patients will be more than 65 to 70 years of age. So actually, the main reason for cause of arteritic AON in a case of Takai's aorta arteritis will be the ocular hypoperfusion. Uh, so and then the take-home message will be Takai's arteritis is always a great challenge for opto, uh, like ophthalmologist to manage. And then it needs a multidisciplinary approach. And then uh, Jane cell arteritis might be the primary cause of arteritic AON, but also other rare type of vasculitis like polyarteritis nodosa and then uh, systemic lupus erythematosus and then herpes host associated vasculitis also should be kept in mind. So actually in any case of arteritic AON, uh, in case of a young patients, it's, uh, like it's always important to rule out all the above mentioned systemic vasculitis. Uh, so, like as it is said, the eye is a window for the body. So, any case of suspected Takayasu retinopathy, the complete systemic evaluation uh, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heyman. That was well within the time limit. Uh, judges, can we have your comments, please? Yeah. Uh, nice presentation, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, can I know before we proceed, uh, are you a PG or are you a consultant right now? Uh, like, sir, I'm actually a postgraduate uh, in Jipma, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A postgraduate in Jipma. I'm a postgraduate. Okay, yes, okay. so uh, this was, uh, the workup was done in uh, Jipma only. Hi, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, can you just uh, share your screen again and show us the FFA and uh, read it? Sorry, I asked that yes. because I used, I, I didn't, uh, if you're a consultant, then I would not have made you uh, read the FFA. So that's why I asked. Can you just go back and read the FFA? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, so, describe the FFA, the left eye. Hi, sir. Actually, left eye showed actually segmental uh, filling defects in the uh, likely after disc and the adjacent actually choroid. And then, which was also also uh, likely associated with actually multiple hyperfluorescent uh, dots, uh, likely which was uh, microaneurysms, which were actually scattered throughout the posterior pole, uh, suggestive of uh, Takayasu retinopathy. Okay, and uh, which vessels uh, do you feel are involved in Takayasu arteritis? Uh, like sir, actually in stage two, actually majorly we will see about actually venous venous dilatation. Whereas as okay. we uh, like the progress to stage three, there will be atrovenous anastomosis. So like okay. stage four will have this ocular ischemic syndrome. So like uh, yeah, like so like so, actually so, the early involvement will be veins and then later arteries. Okay, so you feel which uh, which uh, stage this is. Uh, sir, actually, our stage is uh, uh, like actually when uh, likely when the patient presented, she was actually in a stage two, sir. What yeah. So, so this is the FFA of a stage two. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, because uh, uh, you have to mention that the, the, there was no choroidal ischemia. That is very important, okay, I think. Yeah, choroidal okay, ischemia because uh, arthritis. Takayasu, so everybody thinks arthritis, and this FFA is showing venous dilatation. So yes, you sir. have to uh, you have to emphasize on that point that uh, it is early stage uh, disease. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay.
I think we can conclude. Is there any other questions? Uh, the panelists, panelists, any questions for the participant? This participant or uh, any other participants? I think uh, this is our last presentation for the day. So if there's any remarks or any comments from the side of the judges or panelists, most welcome to please share it with us. Yeah, I'll okay. go with, uh, yeah. I think it was a tremendous effort from each and every, uh, the presenters, like each and every slide had to say, and it was so nicely elaborated. I think it was one of the best sessions to actually be in. And thank you so much all of you, Dr. Pranesh, Dr. Prasanna, Dr. Niranjan, Dr. Karthike, and to actually have us on board and having a program this humongous to actually uh, get into effect. So huge congratulations to everyone. And uh, let's hope uh, it, it, we do have more sessions like this. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Ravnish. Thank you. Any, any other closing remarks? I think uh, all you guys have done brilliantly. All the presenters uh, have presented uh, very, very well. And uh, it was very smooth. I don't think we had too many technical glitches, which is a big thing for Zoom. Uh, also, uh, hats off to all you guys, uh, Karthik, Prasanna, Pranish. All you guys have done brilliantly. And thank you for involving us. And this is what UC stands for. Young ophthalmologists are presenting their work uh, at any stage of their life, which is great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Prasanna, Prasanna, sir, Pranesh, yeah. sir, Karthik, sir, Niranjan, sir, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, involving uh, us as judges. And it was really great to see because uh, all these are postgraduates and they are uh, they have this excellent presentation. Few were like uh, really good. They were up to the international standards uh, uh, in the amount of uh, information they could uh, like uh, uh, put in this uh, five or six or six, five minutes, five minute presentation. So uh, really good presentation, everybody. And uh, I'll just take this opportunity and uh, share my screen and invite everybody to uh, the upcoming uh, AIOCOC forum, uh, which is being held in uh, on 8th and 9th of April in uh, New Delhi. And uh, we are going to have a uh, case presentation inspired from TN, uh, TNOC case presentation. We will have uh, as anti segment presentation. Uh, we will have uh, written a case conference, and then we will have free papers and uh, the video competition for the first time in uh, this AI Social Forum. So I, I, uh, because everybody is UC member, so I would like to extend uh, the invitation to all to attend and participate in the presentations. Thank you, Dr. Nilesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, uh, Karthik, sir. For all all uh, young ophthalmologists to be part of this and encourage uh, UOC to do more uh, meetings like this. So I think all of us should show yeah. up in numbers. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank Definitely, you. Sir. Before, uh, yeah, before we go to the last part and the most important part, uh, I would like to like you all to stay back and uh, give the give the awards for all the presenters. And uh, we would also like to make an announcement that 30 people, more than 30 abstracts were received and uh, it was a huge number of submissions and it was very competitive. We had a prelims yesterday for four and a half hours. I think it went close to four hours, 45 minutes. Uh, uh, and it was, each one of them were equally good in their own speciality and it was very difficult to choose the top uh, nine who are actually here. And uh, we would like to actually uh, extend our uh, heartfelt gratitude to uh, uh, Nirmal sir, who's still with us. Uh, Nirmal sir, can we have you, sir? Uh, yeah, so to uh, Nirmal sir, uh, Nirmal Eye Hospital is actually uh, uh, is funding for the first prize and it's the grand prize of this event. So the winner takes home uh, a grant of 5,000 rupees. So I think Team, team OZ is very grateful uh, to Team Nirmal Eye Hospital for this wonderful gesture for uh, motivating young ophthalmologists at this particular forum and uh, uh, and we were also lucky to have uh, all the nine finalists walking away with some consolation prize or the other. So uh, we would like to extend our uh, heartfelt gratitude uh, and this wonderful initiative by uh, Nirmal Eye Hospital uh, and Nirmal Frederick, sir, the president-elect of TNOA for uh, coming ahead and uh, supporting UC and uh, the TN chapter uh, of Noi Nodi with this wonderful gesture. So we thank you once again, sir, for this wonderful gesture. 
and before uh, welcome uh, yes sir uh, on behalf of team yoc and we are very grateful to them sir and uh, before that uh, we'll go from the ending and uh, karthik meanwhile is compiling the marks so i would like to uh, compiled. yes compile yeah yeah once yeah, karthik ready with the marks uh, we'll be going from the last back end and all the finalists you can switch on your video it was a very competitive and tough competition as we were telling 30 presentations and top 9 were here and uh, we have three three grand prizes and of course the one grand prize the first prize will be announced by dr nirmal sir and he'll be sponsoring it the other eight prizes uh, will be uh, sponsored by team yoc and uh, it's going to be from the back and uh, karthik are you ready uh, with the compilation mm, yeah i am ready yeah, you can share it and uh, you can tell who's announcing the uh, prizes from uh, yeah once you are ready uh, all yours you can start yeah fine yeah yeah fine it was a very tough call everyone had a very close marks i had a very difficult time in giving the winners order uh, i would welcome dr pranesh to inform the uh, give give away the ninth prize okay thank you sir thank you sir the ninth place goes to dr raditya talakula for the case presentation on bilateral hypopituitaries and muscular syndrome in caste of breast aditya are you here you can you can share a few words about the initiative are you there aditya dr aditya not here not here okay no, he's not no. okay congrats go for the yeah well presented doctor coming on to eighth place uh dr akshya will receive the eighth place dr akshya are you here dr akshya dr akshya we have lost we are she is not there okay we, we, at the end of the event we will be posting the leaderboard in the group as well yeah. okay now i would like to call upon dr niranjan to inform the seventh prize okay so it's a pleasant uh... and in, first of all it's a privilege to be announcing the prizes and it's a pleasant coincidence that uh, the seventh place goes to dr niranjana balasubramaniam we share the first name i suppose always congrats dr niranjana are you uh, on board with us okay i think uh, she is also not available with us right now okay sir karthik sir can we go ahead with the next one so oh, i would call i would call upon dr pranesh to inform the sixth prize announce the sixth prize uh the sixth place goes to dr uh, mrithula vijay raghavan dr mrithula you are here you can on your congratulations doctor. amazingly presented yes thank you thank you sir uh, yeah you can say a few words if you want to you are here with that thank you sir it was a good experience thank you thank you doctor Karthik, uh, over to you for the next one. Fifth prize, fifth place, Prasanna, you can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the fifth prize, uh, it goes to uh, Dr. Hemant. Dr. Hemant, you are there. Yes, sir, I am there, sir. Okay, congratulations, uh, Dr. Hemant. Thank you, prize. sir. Yeah. It was a good learning experience, sir. Actually, to present a case, uh, like actually in some actually four to five minutes, uh, like actually it's very important because. Uh, Like because even in our final exams also like we'll be getting very short time to take a case and to present. So like always, it's a good learning experience to actually crisply present whatever uh, like I mean the content we have to present. So like always, actually thankful uh, like for the opportunity, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hemant. Dr. Aditya, you can announce the fourth. The fourth place goes to Dr. Komal. Is Dr. Komal there for her Oscar speech? Is there? Uh, okay, I would. Doctor Komal. Uh, yeah. Um, hello. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me the opportunity to speak on this YOC platform. I'm uh, really grateful for this. Sir. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay, I would thank call you, upon. Sir. I would call upon Doctor Nilesh to announce the third prize. The third prize goes to Doctor Ishwara Nandi for her presentation on carotid melanoma. Congratulations. Can we have Doctor Ishwara? Yes, sir. 
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. It was really a good learning experience. Okay. Next, I would call upon Dr. Avinash to announce the second prize. Uh, thank you for having me. I think we have only two more people to... Actually, it's a surprise. It's between the first and the second. And I think all the cases was... I mean, it was par excellence. And uh, we as uh, seniors or maybe, you know, the whatever panel as well as the uh, judges, we were there. It was very, very good to actually have it. Uh, I uh, the second prize act goes to Dr. Priyanka for a case of double uh, immunosuppression, which led to CMV retinitis. Congratulations, Dr. Priyanka. Priyanka, Dr. Priyanka do you want to say a few words? I think Dr. Priyanka is not there. Okay. Okay. I would next. I would call upon the the guest of honor, the president elect of the UNOA, and uh, Dr. Nirmal to announce the first prize. And uh, the prize is a grand prize of uh, rupees five thousand INR. Uh, and uh, once again, sir, a heartfelt gratitude uh, for Nirmal Eye Hospital and uh, Nirmal Frederick, sir, for supporting uh, UC uh, for this wonderful gesture and uh, giving a grant of five thousand. Rupees INR for the first prize and the grand prize winner. So let's see who is it, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So, so happy to announce the winner for this uh, competition. Dr. Gajeshri is the winner. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. So she is there. Thank you, sir. Right. Congratulations, doctor. Thank you so much. And sir. thank you, thank you, OC team, for the wonderful. Uh, uh, event and also requesting me to join you. So it's been, uh, I've been hearing some of the presentations, uh, really <coughs> wonderful world-class presentations. So congratulate to all the winners, not only, so the presenting itself is a, a sign of maturity and uh, being competitive. So winning again in that is uh, awesome. So congratulations to all the winners and uh, especially to the uh, winner, Dr. Gajeshri. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. No word. Uh, where's your speech, Dr. Gajeshri? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UOC organizer, especially Dr. Karthikeyan and uh, uh, Prasanna sir and uh, Niranjan and Dr. Pranesh and uh, everybody uh, for giving me an opportunity to present here. And uh, and it's more privilege to present on the name of Noi Um I'm so thankful to you, and it's a, a great learning experience. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you for uh, Nimal Eye Hospital. Yeah, welcome. So let, uh, let me know how we transfer the money to Yossi or directly to you. <laughs> I'll show my QR code. <laughs> we'll, we'll help you. <laughs> We'll try to help you out with it, sir. Yes. Okay. 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 Right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, uh, the Young Ophthalmic uh, Society. Hi. Any closing yes, comments? Sir. Yes. Any closing comments from you, sir, for this initiative before we move to the vote of thanks? Uh, yes. Sir. Oh, okay. So you have a formal vote of thanks. That's yes, good. Sir. Right. So let me uh, congratulate all of you uh, because uh, I heard this is the uh, first in. Uh, our Tamil Nadu OC online case presentations. So I'm really happy to be part of this. And uh, coming from uh, young ophthalmologist, uh, right? I'm, I feel I'm still young, but I can see many of you in uh, our uh, senior association. Uh, there are two, three managing committee members here. I think Madan and uh, Prasanna already <coughs> gone to the senior league. So anyway, age is just a number. So we all continue to be a young ophthalmologist at heart. So we are also part of it. So congratulate the organizers, Karthikeyan and uh, Niranjan. Niranjan was uh, going gaga about the uh, initiative and also yesterday's uh, marathon sessions. So Prasanna, Pranesh, so all of you have been doing a wonderful uh, job. I, uh, I've seen many of your uh, work and case presentation earlier in TNOA and in uh, AOS. And incidentally, I happened to saw your uh, AOS program 
that's wonderful, particularly these special sessions. So most of it are uh, really not taught in medical colleges. So these are the initiatives that will actually help you uh, to climb up the ladder, uh, medical legal sessions. And uh, I think my memory is very uh, is, uh, failing me. So I think the, all the four or five sessions were really good. I would be really happy to be a uh, part of it. So I think you've been sitting here for a long time. It's uh, too bad uh, being stationary in one place. So let's, uh, let me not hold you. So thank you for the <coughs> invite and thank you for uh, giving an opportunity to our hospital to be part of the initiative and also help the, uh, the nurse and also your initiative. So thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Uh, yes, uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Uh, T. Nirmal Frederick, sir, the president elect of uh, TNOA, for taking his valuable time and being a part of this wonderful initiative of No Inadi, the first ever uh, Tamil Nadu UC case presentation competition, which was a two day marathon event. Uh, so, we uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, not only your time as well as for coming forward and uh, sponsoring the grand prize of 5,000 INR for the winner. It really motivates uh, the young ophthalmologist even more and it's a wonderful gesture, sir, to thank you once again. Next, we would like to thank uh, the whole UOC team, starting from the office bearers, Dr. Sonal Kalia, Madam, our president. So from day one, uh, Karthik, uh, myself, Dr. Pranesh, Niranjan, have been constantly disturbing uh, Sonal, ma'am, uh, our immediate past president, Dr. Digvijay, sir, uh, our Vice President, uh, Dr. Divakan Mishra, sir, uh, Karan Bhatia, who was there with us yesterday, our uh, secretary. And we also have Dr. Avanish with us, who is uh, our treasurer, as well as one of our judges. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Avanish, for being one of the judges today. And last but not the least, another uh, governing council member, Dr. Nilesh. I think a special uh, shout out to Dr. Nilesh, again, uh, who's been in between his OR and he had to start the link. He had to put the, as we speak, it's going live on YouTube as well. And Nilesh has taken a um, lot of pains uh, to help us the flow of the Zoom as well as the YouTube without any technical glitch. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nilesh, who's also the Joint Secretary of UOC. So again, uh, all the three judges, uh, Nilesh is also part of the judging team for today. Avanish, Nilesh and uh, our own uh, Dr. Aditya Sethi. He's also uh, part of the executive. Uh, Dr. Aditya, thank you once again for being a part of this uh, wonderful initiative and uh, judging us, helping us in judging and bringing out uh, the best uh, nine. So I extend my uh, gratitude to all the OC team, the office bearers, executives, and the judges for uh, the smooth flow of this event, not only to the judges, also to the elite panel. Yesterday we had four sections. So each section had a minimum of nine speakers barring one session where we had six speak speakers and there were in total 12 judges. So all the 12 judges were actually a panel today. So to each one of them, we extend our uh, heartfelt uh, gratitude for judging it meticulously in three columns and giving us the marks. And uh, thank you all the judges of yesterday as well. And uh, to our organizer, to our chair organizer, I should say, Karthik Mahalingam. He has been the real... Uh, leader for among the four rivers, he took the lead. I should uh, say that and I'll be failing in my duty if I don't say that. Two months back, it was Karthik who started this initiative and uh, he pushed me, Dr. Pranesh, Dr. Naranjan. And uh, even today, I would say yesterday night, he was still talking about all the initiatives, what we, what we should do today, how it should be done. Every second, the WhatsApp gets filled up with Karthik's messages. He keeps pushing us. Okay, this is how it should be done. So he was the backbone of this show. And I think uh, myself, Dr. Pranesh and Niranjan, we had a good time uh, supporting you or co-chairing you. And uh, uh, thank you, Karthik, uh, for uh, taking the initiative and the lead. And I think uh, we'll do more for the future uh, under the guidance of uh, seniors as well as along with you. So thank you to uh, Karthik. Again, Dr. Pranesh from my foundation and Dr. Niranjan from uh, uh, Nirmal Frederick's High Hospital. Dr. Pranesh has been uh, the backbone behind uh, the Google Forms, the WhatsApp, even the small flyers that has been designed. I think every work has been almost shared by all four of us equally. And even the mass mailers that we sent to all today to make sure the attendees are going to attend it. And even Dr. Naranjan, 
is a fellow but a young dynamic person who has been taking care of the coordination the dynamicity i think for want of time let us not keep uh, going forward with all that and last but not the least all our 30 participants who are there even uh, some of them for want of time or for duty they are not available today all the 30 participants who were there yesterday and our nine finalists who were there and uh, last but not the least the our sponsor for the first prize again one second dr nirmal sir and uh, kindly please uh, forgive me if i have missed anybody and once again it was a whole team a four team you see and uh, thank you you missed your you missed yourself sir <laughs> yeah uh, three cheers to you <laughs> yeah, thank you thank you to myself as well <laughs> yeah thank you for this yeah, dr prasanna was the part of all this making this uh, sending invitation to everyone mass mailers and everything dr prasanna was doing all along, along with him it's an integral part we thank dr prasanna for the same thank you thank you to the whole team effort uh, over to karthik for the concluding statement and we'll call it a day so uh, i think dr prasanna has thanked everyone so i'll just thank uh, thank you dr nirmal thank you dr nilesh thank you dr aditya and dr avinash who are here and i thank all my co organizer dr pranesh dr naranjan and dr prasanna and i thank all the participants and i thank my pra- teachers professors uh, professor mm-hmm. dr. radha namalai and dr sharmila and dr shreyas for sending their pgs to participate in the event and i finally thank dr sonal whom i'm calling every other day and disturbing her for making this event Th- thank you so much thank you sir let's conclude thank you yes sir thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you sir nilesh aditya avinish thank you sir good night sir thank you yeah thank you so much thank you for having me thank you thank you so much good night I sir good night to all of you to dnoi conference at trichy yes sir yes sir we are be be part of it and sure. also join tnoa for uh, all the activities oh, sir. yeah thank you sir.